As the Lunar New Year of 1968 dawns across South Vietnam, the festivities mask a brewing storm. Streets bustle with celebration, while soldiers lie in plain sight, their weapons concealed in tunnels or throughout holiday cargo. Unknown to many, Viet Cong operatives disguised amid the revelers prepare for a stunning assault. In the rain-soaked battlegrounds of Khe Sanh, U.S. Marines faced unexpected ambushes, a harbinger of the chaos to come. The night of January 29th approaches, and the Tet celebrations bring on a year that Vietnam will never forget. Back in the mid-1960s, South Vietnam grappled with intense political instability. The assassination of President Ngo Dinh Diem during the CIA-backed coup in 1963 led to a series of military juntas trying and failing to consolidate power. Widespread mistrust of these short-lived governments allowed communist propaganda to gain traction among the South Vietnamese people. The National Liberation Front, better known as the Viet Cong, was able to make use of North Vietnamese support to exploit this political vulnerability, gaining power and influence. Meanwhile, North Vietnam was progressing through a successful five-year initiative to bolster its economy and defense capabilities. As concerns over the spread of communism grew during the Cold War, the United States gradually expanded its military role in Vietnam. Initially focused on advisory and logistical support for South Vietnam's military, direct American involvement increased, with troop numbers reaching over 184,300 troops by the end of 1965. Napoleon once said, an army marches on its stomach. And as any good general knows, armies with fresh and plentiful food sources are more effective than those without. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh, you won't need a well-stocked commissary to perform at your best. HelloFresh is a food delivery service dedicated to making cooking at home easy, fun, and affordable. With my busy schedule, I don't have time for complicated recipes, and I don't want to risk my health or budget by constantly ordering out. HelloFresh solves this dilemma by offering healthy meal kits made using fresh produce sourced directly from farmers and delivered right to your door. Choose from a delicious and varied menu of over 45 dinner options that suit any healthy lifestyle. Select a delivery date and let HelloFresh take care of the rest. Packed with fresh ingredients, everything arrives at your doorstep pre-portioned for less hassle. This is the perfect solution for anyone looking to start the year healthy. And when you join HelloFresh, you'll get free breakfast for life while your subscription is active. I received three meals this week, and the portions for two are perfect. The best part is that the recipes teach you how to cook meals that would otherwise be unapproachable for people who, like me, have limited cooking skills. Making dinner is now something I can look forward to, especially when I can make a meal together with my wife. Click the link down in the description, or use my code on screen, and get free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. Observing the expanding U.S. role, North Vietnam adjusted its strategies and emphasized unity, readiness, and the need for modern weaponry in its communications to the communist leadership. The intensity of the conflict grew, and by the end of 1967, the U.S. had deployed over 485,000 troops to Vietnam. In an effort to counteract the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces, the U.S. initiated a series of search and destroy missions. This approach began in 1965 with the ferocious battle of the Ya Trang Valley in the Central Highlands, marking the first use of air mobile warfare by the U.S. Army. From 1966 to 1967, three successive operations were launched in Binyong and Tay Ninh provinces, which were recognized as key communist strongholds. All the while, North Vietnamese forces honed their guerrilla tactics and focused on strengthening and securing liberated regions, demonstrating their goal to establish control and garner local support. During a meeting in July 1967, political and military leaders of the Communist High Command met in Hanoi. 
they realized that their current tactics had been focused on targeted periodic attacks and daily skirmishes, all designed to unsettle their enemy and chip away at their confidence. However, this was not enough to turn the tide. The increase of America's intervention in Vietnam forced the communists to up the stakes. For this new strategy against the South, meticulous planning and coordination was required that would span several months. The Politburo, under leaders like Le Zon and Zhuang Qin, played a pivotal role in orchestrating this new offensive. Directed by the Politburo and the Central Military Party Committee, representatives from the General Staff were dispatched to battle zones around the country. Their mission was twofold, assess the on-ground situation and motivate local troops to prepare for intensified combat while stockpiling essential supplies. The Politburo had set their sights on a significant victory in 1968, underscoring the need to directly confront and overpower US forces. They devised a surprise assault targeting urban hubs, including Saigon, Hue, and Da Nang, with the goal of overwhelming both US troops and their South Vietnamese allies. All these plans were shrouded in secrecy, with North Vietnamese leaders undergoing specialized training sessions on advanced military tactics. Besides the planning and coordination, another crucial insight came from the on-the-ground experiences of soldiers already in the field. General Vo Win Zap proved invaluable for these preparations. While General Zap is often celebrated for his triumph against the French at Dien Bien Phu, the expertise he amassed between 1965 and 1967 was equally crucial. During these years, both the Viet Cong and People's Army of Vietnam fought extensively against American and South Vietnamese troops, gaining important combat experience. They recognized the protective advantage of underground tunnels against airstrikes, saw firsthand the success of ambush strategies, and understood the strategic significance of the Ho Chi Minh Trail for supply lines and troop movements. Under Zop's seasoned leadership, the North Vietnamese were well equipped and ready for the forthcoming offensive. To help facilitate the constant need for better equipment and supplies, North Vietnam looked to supplement its native production through continued support of communist allies, which included China and the Soviet Union. Throughout 1967, the Soviets delivered a substantial number of aircraft, radar sets, artillery pieces, air defense systems, and thousands of small arms, complemented by military training advisors. China contributed similarly, furnishing the North with aircraft, artillery, tanks, and a significant number of logistical supplies such as uniforms, radios, and vehicles. This external support meant that the North Vietnamese were well armed boasting a diverse arsenal that included standard weapons like the SKS, AK-47s, RPG-2 rocket launchers, and even more substantial artillery. Despite this support, the North still faced an enemy boasting superior technology and firepower. To counter this, a series of intricate tunnel networks were established all throughout the country. Communist fighters were able to rest, resupply, and travel across multiple fronts without alerting the enemy. These tunnels also provided storage and shelter, protecting fighters and their equipment from American air power. The logistical cunning of these tunnels was especially important for the new offensive. Troops and supplies coming off the Ho Chi Minh Trail could be funneled directly into networks like Su Chi, where weapons could be stored, troops staged, and command centers established to help direct operations before the upcoming attack. One such operation began in January 1968 with the Battle of Khe Sanh. During this time, battalions of the U.S. Marine Corps 26th Marine Regiment faced ambushes from the Pavin's 304th and 325C Divisions. The monsoon season provided a shield for Pavin forces, who used the heavy downpours to capture strategic points around the combat base. Even with prior intelligence, the Marines under Colonel David E. Lowndes were caught off guard. 
This early assault was made worse by a devastating explosion that ripped through the Quezon combat base after its ammo dump was struck by Pavin artillery fire. With the Marines under siege and almost encircled, American air support under Operation Niagara was intensified to shield the battered Marines. This fierce confrontation, closely watched by the media, foreshadowed the broader offensive looming on the horizon. During Tet Nguyen Dan, or the Lunar New Year, an expected ceasefire lulled South Vietnam into complacency. Capitalizing on this, communists discreetly transported weapons into cities using trucks filled with festive goods. Mourners hid arms in coffins, and explosives nestled among everyday food. The Viet Cong, some disguised in Arvin uniforms, blended with holiday crowds. On the night of January 29th to the 30th, 1968, leveraging the Tet celebrations, they set the time for their widespread offensive against South Vietnam's urban centers. At 12.30 a.m. on January 30th, the Viet Cong launched a coordinated assault on key Central Highland locations, Tan Kine, Ban Mai Thuat, Pleiku, and Con Tum. These strategic cities were caught off guard, with U.S. and Arvin forces facing intense combat. Pleiku saw the U.S. 4th Infantry and Arvin 2nd Division under siege, while Ban Mai Thua and Con Tum witnessed urban warfare and pitched battles, respectively. Nha Jang, housing the Arvin Airborne Training Center and the U.S. Army's 5th Special Forces Group, became a key battlefield. Kui Nun, the logistics hub for U.S. and Arvin forces, confronted assaults from several North Vietnamese contingents. Di Hua and Hoi An, both vital transport hubs, saw fierce clashes as their primary defenders, Arvin units reinforced by local militias, stood firm against the onslaught. The fighting displaced many civilians, especially those who had been relocated to counterinsurgency zones. These areas, established by the South Vietnamese government with U.S. support, were meant to isolate villagers from Viet Cong influence. However, these so-called strategic hamlets became untenable as battle raged and front lines shifted. Many civilians found themselves in harm's way and were forced to flee. Some sought refuge in areas thought to be more secure, while others embarked on a poignant journey back to their ancestral homes, often traversing war-torn landscapes in search of safety and familiarity. As Vietnam erupted into all-out war, both the People's Army and Viet Cong carried out attacks on key urban centers across the South. Da Nang, a crucial port, became a focal point for the Central Highlands. Despite intelligence indicating a major assault, defenses manned by the Arvin 51st Regiment, 1st U.S. Marine Units, and the 2nd Korean Marine Brigade faced challenges due to incomplete intelligence reports, leading to underestimations and deployment delays. As the offensive began, defenders confronted multiple attacks targeting vital sites. Amidst fierce urban combat, U.S. Marine expertise proved critical. Over time, the combined American, Korean, and Arvin forces successfully repelled the assault, regaining control over Da Nang's strategic areas. Another key target was Saigon, South Vietnam's capital. North Vietnam's strategy, dubbed the General Uprising, aimed for both military gains and psychological impact. The brazen Viet Cong assault on the U.S. Embassy on January 31st was a prime example of this psychological warfare. Viet Cong sappers infiltrated the compound, with a six-hour battle ensuing before U.S. forces regained control. The city saw other major assaults, including the Presidential Palace and Tan Son Yut Air Base, designed to challenge the South Vietnamese government's credibility. Although the embassy wasn't captured, its breach deeply unsettled U.S. command, who feared for the possibility of further assaults throughout other cities. Meanwhile, the historic city of Hue became a major battleground. The 6th Pavin Regiment and Viet Cong forces mounted a coordinated attack, capturing significant portions, including the Imperial Citadel. The subsequent battle was among the offensive's fiercest. The 1st Marine Regiment, alongside the 1st and 3rd Arvin Divisions, faced challenging urban warfare against entrenched enemies within Hue's ancient structures. 
Under General William Westmoreland, U.S. strategy saw their forces combating regular enemy units, while Arvin divisions focused on pacification efforts in the surrounding area. After 26 intense days, U.S. and Arvin forces finally reclaimed Hue. The city, including many historical sites, was left devastated. Post-battle, chilling accounts surfaced of mass executions by North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces targeting suspected South Vietnamese allies. Fighting continued at Khe San, as Pavin forces continued to wear away the spirits of the besieged Marines. Inspired by his strategy at Dien Bien Phu, General Zop aimed for a total prolonged encirclement of the Americans. The Marines at Khe San combat base faced a battle of attrition enduring daily artillery attacks and sniper fire, along with the usual assaults from Pavin troops. To combat this, Marines patrolled aggressively, engaging Pavin forces in intense skirmishes. General Westmoreland saw strategic value in the fighting at Quezon. For him, Quezon was a magnet that pulled Pavin forces away from populated zones, potentially diluting the Tet Offensive's impact on other areas of the country. That said, he wasn't prepared to leave the Marines to Zop's mercy. To bolster the encircled Marines, Operation Niagara continued to provide close combat support through American air power and a vast aerial bombardment operation. B-52 Stratofortress bombers, working under Operation Arclight, unleashed massive payloads against communist assaults, and fighter aircraft delivered critical air support that kept the Marines in fighting condition, as well as blunting Pavan operations in the area. Though the Arvin was engaged predominantly in other Tet arenas, its 37th Ranger Battalion was positioned at Long Ve, a nearby Special Forces camp. This camp faced a significant challenge on February 7th when Pavan troops, reinforced with PT-76 tanks, breached its defenses, leading to the camp's capture and adding to Khe San's isolation. Although Viet Cong forces weren't the primary combatants at Khe San, they were instrumental in the wider Tet Offensive, targeting urban hubs and employing psychological tactics against South Vietnam's citizens. The 77-day Khe San siege epitomized the Vietnam War's wear-down approach. Despite the Marines' resilience, both sides endured massive losses. Bombings dramatically altered Khe San's terrain, rendering it into a crater-filled wasteland. The suddenness of the Tet Offensive exposed significant gaps in U.S. and South Vietnamese intelligence. Based on optimistic evaluations and past successes, U.S. intelligence drastically underestimated the Communists' boldness and potential, especially during supposed truce times like the Tet Holidays. This oversight, combined with an echo chamber effect among U.S. commanders advising Arvin leaders, magnified the shock. The grand bulwark of America's alliance with South Vietnam was illusory. What was meant to be an unbreakable fortress holding the South together was instead riddled with silent cracks, loyalties left in doubt from the South Vietnamese, and outdated analogies from America's general staff. These issues skewed perceptions of how the North might actually conduct their offensive, which left the South Vietnamese and Americans reeling once the North finally pressed their attack. The Tet attacks forced U.S. leadership to reassess their understanding of the enemy's capabilities and intentions. The Communists demonstrated not just their tactical strength, but also strategic insight that the U.S. had overlooked. As U.S. forces rallied in response, the Arvin's crucial role and resilience became evident. Though their vulnerabilities were also starkly highlighted whenever isolated or left without U.S. support. While the Viet Cong and Pavin suffered immense tactical losses, the ferocity of the offensive cast doubts on the U.S.'s ongoing approach. By mid-1968, America had deployed 540,000 troops and spent $20 billion annually, with the Air Force leading an unprecedented ground support campaign for over three years. 
North Vietnam's surprise attacks during Tet were mostly repelled within days, with the US 7th Air Force playing a pivotal role. The enemy's high casualties cost them a significant portion of the total troops engaged. Numbers vary depending on sources, but even the Pavin's own conservative estimates put these casualties over 111,000. For the US, the unexpected scale of the offensive eroded public confidence in the government's war strategy, despite US and South Vietnamese forces repelling most attacks. This changing sentiment catalyzed America's prolonged withdrawal from Vietnam, which culminated in 1973. The cost of victory was steep, with over 1,100 Americans and thousands of South Vietnamese soldiers wounded or killed in the initial weeks. By March's end, casualties included 1,000 American and over 2,000 Arvin and Allied deaths. This highlighted concerns about the Saigon government's ability and Arvin's ability to fend off future communist offensives without U.S. support. For North Vietnam, the offensive was deemed a strategic success, symbolizing their resilience and the notion that an unwavering desire for independence couldn't be suppressed, even by a superpower. Post Tet, U.S. military strength in Vietnam underwent scrutiny, realizing that sheer military strength might not dictate war outcomes. Still, it came at a great cost, with over 100,000 dead soldiers and tens of thousands of Vietnamese civilians killed, wounded, or displaced over the course of 1968. The Tet Offensive marked the biggest turning point for North Vietnam and its struggle against the South.